I want to add my thanks to the Commonwealth Fund and also thank all of you for being here. Craig and Jason did a nice job of summarizing some of the ways in which behavioral economics is being used to influence behavior more broadly. And what I'm going to do is focus more on thinking about financial incentives and some of the lessons learned from our work on financial incentives for patients and how they could be applied to providers. In our enthusiasm for thinking about behavioral approaches, though, I don't want us to lose thought, lose sight of some general issues in terms of pay for performance and provider incentives. So these approaches, of course, are only as good as the underlying measurement of performance. One of the challenges in terms of measuring provider performance is that measuring multidimensional performance well is very difficult. People will, of course, respond to what's being measured, what's being incented. Uh, groups will often try to capture the regulator, in essence, perhaps uh, putting more effort into adjusting the measures as opposed to improving performance. And we also have to be careful about crowding out pro-social motivation. So as we've thought about this from the standpoint of incenting behavior, our, our group has developed a framework that looks at the various decision errors that make people incompletely rational, and really thinking about how you design incentive programs as a result. And a lot of this is related to our experience with patient-based programs. But for example, we know people have very strong present bias preferences. They're much more focused on the immediate costs and benefits of their actions as opposed to the future costs. The obvious implication of that is that you don't want to reward people necessarily at the end of a year. You want to think, how do you make these rewards fairly immediate, the feedback fairly frequent? Another example is the framing and segregating of rewards. So a common way in which this is done among consumers is to adjust their premiums, their health insurance premiums. And this is a, a way which, in essence, can bury fairly large amounts of money. So if I'm giving somebody $100 and I do it by adjusting their premium and that gets automatically deposited in their paycheck, uh, I've just made it fairly invisible because that money is deposited electronically. Contrast that with handing somebody $100. And it's very similar when you think about providers. If you tie this bonus to their overall paycheck, uh, the bonus will, will appear to be very small and may not even be noticed. Lots of other work's been done in terms of thinking about the overweighting of small probabilities. People in general don't understand probabilities very well. Uh, instead of using this to take advantage of people, as most state lotteries do, uh, we can use this to try to help people engage in healthy behavior at higher rates. And similarly, we know people uh, in, engage in anticipated regret. They're very loss averse. There's a very strong status quo bias. All of these factors can be leveraged to make these types of programs more effective. An example of how we did this was among employees at General Electric. Our team worked on a project in which we randomized people to either get information about smoking cessation programs or the same information plus an incentive of $750 that was taken out of the premium and separate from premiums. You can see this worked pretty well. We had quit rates at a year of 5% in the control group, 147 in the incentive group, so a ratio of about 2.9, and this led to a program that was implemented by GE for all their employees in the US in 2010. There's lots of work that's been done in a lot of these areas, and because of, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through these, but let's suffice to say, lots of studies have shown very strong effects of defaults and status quo bias, as Craig was describing, the impacts of present bias and the importance of tying feedback and incentives to the frequency of the behaviors you're trying to change. Lots of work's been done regarding loss aversion. Uh, this is, it, I think the data on that is obviously pretty clear. Regret aversion, informing people that they'd miss out on rewards they could have won, overweighting small probabilities, and the importance of social context and really thinking about ways to leverage that as part of the designs of these programs. I think in contrast to patients, it's important to recognize physicians probably are much more rational in contrast to a patient who might have a low or moderate level of information, uh, who at the time of a decision, certainly in the context of an acute illness, is going to be emotional, ill, vulnerable. Uh, if, it's a, if, if it's a new diagnosis, it's not going to be a repeat action. It may be the first time they've encountered this. Education levels are going to be highly variable. Uh, physicians, of course, in contrast, uniformly, one would hope, have high levels of information, 
they're fairly dispassionate. Uh, they, this is a repeat action for them. They have uniformly high education levels. So I think we can expect a much higher level of rationality from physicians than we can from patients. That said, when we're thinking about the design of provider payment and incentives, behavioral insights can still be used to make those incentives more effective than they are. And Jason alluded to, I think, the, the, the data on pay for performance and how a lot of those programs haven't been that effective. I think a lot of it relates to how they're designed, uh, as, as everybody here knows fee-for-service is predominant, and the pay-for-performance programs in the U.S. that are layered on top of that are usually only a few percent of compensation. So that's part of it. But I think some of it is that the design elements haven't been uh, really addressed. One is to keep these programs simple. A lot of the programs that are on the field have become incredibly complicated. People don't know what they're being incented to do. It's very hard to keep track of. And when there are a lot of things they're being incented to do, it obviously dilutes each one of them. Another big issue is that small incentives don't work. There's something called the peanuts effect, which has been pretty documented. Uh, there, I think there is a need for more frequent feedback. A lot of programs just give feedback at the end of the year. And while providers may not have present bias to the same degree as a lot of patients, that, that obviously is a factor as well. Another opportunity is to really just think about unbundling incentives from other payments. When you tie this into provider pay paychecks, which tend to be pretty large, those incentive amounts can easily uh, be fairly invisible. And then we can also, of course, think about in framing incentives as a risk versus a bonus. There's a lot of approaches that have been tested and shown to work in patients that I suspect would not work well in providers or might be seen as unpalatable. So for example, the use of lotteries. Uh, you can imagine the headlines that might come with that, and I, th I suspect mo most of them would be fairly unfavorable. Uh, you can also imagine that you'd get a lot of pushback if you were really playing on the concepts of anticipated regret. I, I don't think providers would necessarily respond well to that. Even loss aversion, uh, literally applied, would be fairly difficult to implement here, where the strongest way of doing this, of course, is to pay providers, and then if they fail to achieve performance measure X, Y, or Z, have them pay you back. Uh, that would be difficult to do. There, there are softer ways of doing that, which could be done, but then might be less effective. And then I think social norming is also a little bit tricky. Uh, you have to consider, are we comparing on measures where more is better or more is worse? How public are those comparisons within the provider group, with the provider's patients? I think there's some sensitivity there that, that would also need to be carefully considered. So in terms of future directions, I, there are a couple of points I wanted to highlight. One is that there are a lot of situations where currently we're incenting providers and where we're incenting providers to accomplish something that's probably more under the patient's control. So for example, if we think about poor cholesterol control among patients at high risk of heart attacks, uh, it's an open question. Do you incent the provider? Do you incent the patient? Do you incent a combination of the true? This is a study we're doing in partnership with, with Geisinger, Harvard Vanguard, with support from the, from the National Institutes of Aging, where we're trying to address several limitations to P4P, pulling these payments out of provider payments, rewarding improvement or attainment of a threshold. Uh, people will obviously work harder if they're closer to achieving a goal as opposed to a farther away from a goal. So the idea here is to set up a series of goals that they can attain. Uh, we want to align incentives for patients and providers here. And then we're also just giving providers better feedback so they know whether their patients are using their pills every day because they're, they're getting wireless uh, pill bottles. Another big area to think about is as provider payment shifts from a fee-for-service model to more of a model of population-based financing and ACOs, is really thinking what is the future going to be looking like in terms of what providers are going to do. A lot of care is going to move outside of doctor's offices and be done uh, at home remotely using wireless devices. And the basic intuition here is that even if you have a lot of chronic diseases, you only spend a couple of hours a year in front of a doctor, 5,000 plus waking hours elsewhere. There's a lot of opportunity here to leverage wireless devices and really think about the feedback loops that can be created. Uh, the way we've done this at Penn is we give patients lots of different kinds of wireless devices. These upload data automatically to a server, and then we do a lot of testing. 
around the kinds of feedback to the patient, to a family or friend, to a peer, uh, through an exception handling process to providers. Sometimes this involves financial incentives, sometimes social incentives, but lots of opportunity to think about how do we leverage the capabilities of these technologies. Uh, one of the projects we're most excited about is a project that CMMI is funding that we're doing with a, a number of insurance companies where we give every patient who's had a heart attack, uh, these are patients in, in 42 states, uh, per, v v wireless pill bottles, daily lottery type incentives. We have a family member or friend who automatically gets notified uh, if you miss two doses of your medicine. And then we have clinical social workers who call you if you miss four doses. Here's the enrollment by state. Uh, you can see that relative to making medicines free, this is the data from the MI Free study uh, that Natish Chowdhury published a few years ago in New England Journal. We're getting phenomenal rates of adherence to cardiovascular medication. And I think one of the keys is to really think about as the healthcare delivery system changes and what we expect of providers uh, changes, we have to think how do we build that into these types of provider incentives programs. I think it's going to get, there's going to be more opportunity, but it also gets more complicated. So we have to carefully consider what sort of provider incentives make sense. Incorporating behavioral insights into these designs, I, I think, provides an opportunity, but we have to be careful to avoid upsetting providers too much. Future provider incentives may leverage population and health tools that don't currently exist on a wide scale, but that are coming rapidly. And then finally, we need to think about where are we incenting providers as opposed to patients, and where is it most efficient to do so? Thank you.